All right, welcome to another episode of Mike Reads. Today we'll be continuing in our series on Thomas Sowell's Discrimination and Disparities with Chapter 3. We should be able to get this through this chapter in just two reads. So without further ado, Chapter 3, Sorting and Unsorting People. Much empirical evidence suggests that human beings do not interact randomly, nor as frequently or in, as intensely, with all other human beings as with selected subsets of people like themselves. In short, people sort themselves out, both in where they choose to live and with whom they choose to interact most often and most closely. It is worth examining some of that empirical evidence as to self-sorting before going on to consider the consequences of third-party sorting or unsorting of other people. The crucial point here is that, when people spontaneously sort themselves, the results are seldom even or random, and are often quite skewed. Residential Sorting and Unsorting <clears throat> Where people live has, at various times and places, been decided either by the people themselves or by others who imposed various restrictions through a variety of institutional devices, ranging from governmental laws and policies to many private formal and informal means, ranging from restrictive covenants to homeowners associations to outright violence against individuals or groups who have sought to live in neighborhoods where they are not welcome. Residential and Social Self-Sorting Immigrants have seldom immigrated evenly or randomly from their country of origin nor have they settled evenly or randomly in the country they reached. For example, two provinces in mid-19th century Spain containing 6% of the Spanish population supplied 67% of the Spanish immigrants to Argentina. Moreover, these immigrants tended to live clustered together in particular neighborhoods in Buenos Aires. Similarly skewed patterns of settlement have been common around the world, among other immigrants moving from their country of origin to their country of settlement. During the era of mass emigration from Italy, for example, Italian immigrants in Australia, Brazil, Canada, Argentina, and the United States not only tended to cluster together in predominantly Italian neighborhoods, but, more specifically, within those neighborhoods people from Genoa, Naples, or Sicily clustered, to, clustered together with other people from those same respective places in Italy. During that same era, the massive immigration of Eastern European Jews to America was considered in New York's low, lower was concentrated in New York's Lower East Side. But within those Jewish neighborhoods, Hungarian Jews were largely clustered in their own enclaves as were Jews from Romania, Russia, and other places in Eastern Europe. German Jews, who had lived in their own enclave in the Lower East Side decades before the mass arrival of Eastern European Jews, were already leaving that neighborhood as they rose socioeconomically, and were increasingly locating in other parts of New York as the Eastern European Jews arrived. Such spatial and social separation between German Jews and Eastern European Jews was common, both in New York and in Chicago. Lebanese immigrants to Sierra Leone in Africa or Colombia in South America likewise settled in enclaves of other Lebanese from the same parts of Lebanon and of the same religion with Catholic Lebanese from particular places in Lebanon settling together, with, settling together and separate from enclaves of Orthodox Christians from Lebanon or Lebanese Shiite Muslims. German immigrants who settled in 19th century New York not only settled in an area of Manhattan called Klein Deutschland, Little Germany, Hessians clustered in one part of Klein Deutschland, while Prussians clustered in another. People tend to sort themselves out, not only in their residential patterns, but also in their social interactions. 20th century Japanese immigrants to Brazil not only settled in Japanese enclaves, most Okinawan immigrants in Brazil married other Okinawans rather than marrying Japanese from other parts of Japan, much less marrying members of the Brazilian population at large. 
It was much the same story among German, German immigrants in 19th century New York, where most Bavarians married other Bavarians, and most Prussians married other Prussians. Among the Irish immigrants as well, most 19th century marriages that took place in New York's Irish enclaves were marriages between people from the same country in Ireland. In the Australian city of Griffith, in the years from 1920 to 1933, 90% of Italian men who had immigrated from Venice and gotten married in Australia married Italian women who had also emigrated from Venice. Another 5% married Italian women from other parts of Italy, the same percentage as married British Australian women. However striking these patterns may be statistically, they are not patterns that most people are made aware of by seeing them with the naked eye, as is the case with different differences between black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods in the United States. As a result, black-white residential separations have been seen and treated as if they were unique, as well as being inconsistent with prevailing background assumptions of equal or random outcomes in the absence of discriminatory impositions. History shows that there have been, in fact, discriminatory impositions of residential patterns at various times and places, not only as regards blacks in the United States, but also many other groups in countries around the world. These include the original ghettos imposed on Jews in much of Europe in the centuries past. But that does not, by itself, mean that all residential sorting and social sorting are externally imposed or need to be externally er eradicated. Sorting has, been a common, has, sorting has been as common within black neighborhoods as within other neighborhoods around the world. Back in the 1930s, the research of noted black scholar E. Franklin Frazier showed clear patterns of residential clustering of people with different ways of life within the black community in Chicago. After dividing that community into seven zones, Professor Frazier showed empirically that the proportion of adults to children varied greatly from one zone to another, as did the ratio of males to females, and the percentage of mulattoes in the population was several times higher in one zone than in another. Moreover, these were not simply isolated differences. They were differences reflecting different socioeconomic levels and differences in family stability and behavioral standards. Delinquency rates within Chicago's black community ranged from more than 40% in some neighborhoods to under 2% in others. In 19th century Detroit, black home homeowners lived clustered together and separate from black renters. Similar residential differentiation took place in Cleveland's black community. A history of Harlem pointed out occupational differences among people who returned home from work and got off at different subway stops in Harlem. Mid-20th century data showed income distribution among blacks in the country as a whole to be slightly more unequal than among whites. So did later data. A 1966 study indicated that among the... the more than 4 million black American families at the time, just 5.2 thousand families produced all the black physicians, dentists, lawyers, and academic doctorates in the country. Despite how exceptional such occupations and achievements were among blacks at the time, these particular families averaged 2.2 into 5 individuals each in those categories. That is, Every four such families averaged nine individuals at these levels. Awareness of such social differences was both widespread and often acute within the black population. There is a whole literature on exclusive black elites, including such books as Aristocrats of Color by, William, by Willard B. Gatewood, Our Kind of People by Lawrence Otis Graham, and certain people by Stephen Birmingham. Particular upscale neighborhoods within mid-20th century Harlem were known as Strivers Row and Sugar Hill. A luxury apartment building at 409 Edgecombe Avenue was so widely known as a residence of the black elite that it was said to be sufficient to get into a taxi in Harlem and simply say 409 for the driver to know where to take you. 
similar patterns existed in Chicago. There had long been a small black community in Chicago in the 19th century before the great migrations of blacks from the South in the 20th century led to several fold increases in the number of blacks in that city. Those blacks born and bred in, the ni- in 19th century Chicago and living as small enclaves of blacks in an overwhelmingly white population had over time assimilated culturally to the norms of the surrounding society as other groups have in similar circumstances. The later massive migrations of southern blacks to Chicago in the 20th century created acute polarization within the black community there. The Chicago Defender, a black newspaper, was highly critical of the newcomers for behavior that gave blacks in general a bad name. So were other blacks from the pre-existing black community there and in other northern cities where both the existing black residents and the local black press denounced the new arrivals from the South as vulgar, rowdy, unwashed, and criminal. Like other black newspapers in northern communities, the Chicago Defender published many admonitions to southern blacks arriving in Chicago, including, don't, quote, don't use vile language in public places, don't allow yourself to be drawn into street bowels, don't take the part of lawbreakers, be they men, women, or children, and don't abuse or violate the confidence of those who give you employment, end quote. As with other racial or ethnic groups in other times and places, blacks in these northern communities feared that the arrival of less assimilated members of their own race would provoke negative reactions in a larger society that would not only jeopardize the progress of their race, but would even threaten retrogressions as the larger society turned against blacks in general. These fears as to how the new black arrivals from the South would behave and how the local white population would react against blacks in general both turned out to be all too well founded. A study in early 20th century Pennsylvania, for example, showed that the rate of violent crimes among black migrants from the South was nearly five times the rate of such crimes by blacks born in Pennsylvania. The South had long been the country's most violent region, among blacks and whites alike. Negative reaction from northern whites set in, as feared, and affected blacks in many ways. Some northern communities where black children had for years been going to the same schools as white children now began to impose racial segregation in the schools. In Washington, blacks were no longer allowed in many white theaters, restaurants, or hotels, and their opportunities to work in a white-collar occupation shrank. There were similar trends in Cleveland and Chicago, among other places. Oberlin College and Harvard, where black students had lived in dormitories with white students before, now excluded black students from their dormitories. As these retrogressions set in in northern cities, black civic organizations such as the Urban League sought to assimilate the newcomers to existing norms of behavior, just as civic and religious organizations among the Irish and the Jews did earlier in order to get Irish and Jewish immigrants assimilated to American cultural standards. The conclusion that the the widespread retrogressions and racial opportunities open to blacks in northern cities in the early 20th century were a result of the massive migration of less acculturated southern blacks to those communities is reinforced by the history of the mass migration of southern blacks to the Pacific coast decades later. In the 1940s, during World War II, industries produced military equipment and supplies on the Pacific coast attracted vast numbers of blacks and whites from the south. Henry Kaiser's huge shipyard in Richmond, California alone employed more than 90,000 people and there were similar war industries in other West Coast communities. As among northern cities in the 19th century, blacks were a very small percentage of the population on the Pacific coast before these mass migrations from the south, and were correspondingly more acculturated to the behavioral norms of the surrounding society than were southern blacks arriving there. Prior to the 1940s, racial discrimination was not on the same scale on the Pacific coast as in the south, or as in northeastern cities after the great migrations there from the south. 
In San Francisco, black children went to schools that were not racially segregated in the small black population, and the small black population lived in neighborhoods with whites, Chinese, and other races. The great migrations of blacks out of the South that reached the northeastern Midwest and Midwestern cities around the time of the First World War reached the Pacific Coast decades later during the Second World War. During the 1940s, more than four-fifths of the blacks who arrived in the San Francisco Bay Area shipyards came from the South, usually the less educated Deep South. The new black arrivals were overwhelmingly more numerous than the existing black population. In Richmond, California, for example, there were only 270 black residents in 1940, but the Kaiser Industries brought in more than 10,000. The black population of Berkeley in the 1950 census was nearly four times what it had been in the 1940 census before the United States was at war. Over that same span of time, the black population of Oakland rose to more than five times what it had been before, and that of San Francisco rose to approximately nine times its 1940 level. As in the northern cities earlier in the 20th century, the new black arrivals on the West Coast were seen by the existing black population there as vulgar and ill-behaved. And, as in northern cities decades earlier, the arrival of the newcomers was followed by retrogressions in black-white relations. The Prevalence of Sorting In countries around the world, innumerable groups have sorted themselves in many ways, both residentially and socially. The sorting extends right down to the individual level. The correlation between the IQs of husbands and wives is at least as high as the correlation between IQs of brothers and sisters, even though there is no biological reason for the IQs of husbands and wives to be similar as there is with brothers and sisters. Clearly, people sort themselves out when choosing whom to marry even though they are highly unlikely to actually know the IQ of the person they marry before the wedding, nor necessarily even afterwards. Yet the net result of their spontaneous and informal setting produces this statistical correlation nevertheless. There are many kinds of sorting, including sorting by lifestyle in bohemian neighborhoods like Greenwich Village, which represents an unsorting by such other criteria as race or social class origins. Yet what is far harder to find is the even or random distribution of different kinds of people in places or endeavors that is widely treated as a norm, deviations from which are regarded as evidence of discrimination and a sense of discrimination too. From the standpoint of particular individuals, there is no question that large and sometimes devastating costs can be imposed because of the actions of other members of the group to which they belong even when the particular individual has played no part in those actions to which members of other groups object. Such individuals are clearly victims, but of whom? The hooligans and criminals who have caused other groups to seek to protect the hooligans and criminals who have caused other groups to seek to protect their own safety and security of their homes and families? From a moral perspective, there is no obvious solution unless the interests of one set of people automatically trump the interests of another which hardly seems moral, even if it may be politically expedient or in keeping with whatever the social vogues of the time may be. An episode involving sociologist William Julius Wilson presents a much milder version of the dilemma faced earlier during the Great Migrations. Quote, I am an internationally known Harvard professor, Yet a number of unforgettable experiences remind me that, as a black male in America looking considerably younger than my age, I am also feared. For example, several times over the years I have stepped into the elevator of my condominium dressed in casual clothes and could immediately tell from the body language of the other residents in the elevator that I made them feel uncomfortable. Were they thinking, what is this black man doing in this expensive condominium? Are we in any danger? I once sarcastically said to a nervous elderly couple who hesitated to exit the elevator because we were all getting off on the same floor, not to worry, I am a Harvard professor and I have lived in this building for nine years. When I am dressed casually, I am always a little relieved to step into an empty elevator, 
but I am not apprehensive if I am wearing a tie. I get angry each time I have an experience like the encounter in the elevator. End quote. Professor Wilson's sarcasm and anger were directed at people whose reactions reflected a greater concern for their own personal safety than for his sensitive sensitivities. His account suggests that they were not racist, for merely by wearing a tie he avoided tensions on both sides, even though wearing a tie did not change his race. Unlike blacks from an earlier era, who clearly blamed those blacks whose behavior had brought on a retrogression that hurt all blacks, Professor Wilson's account gives no indication of any sense that he was paying the social price for dangers created by black hooligans and criminals. A different view of such situation was taken by another black scholar, Professor Walter E. Williams, an economist at George Mason University. Quote, Information is not costless. People therefore seek to economize on information cost. In doing so, they tend to substitute less expensive forms of information for more expensive forms. Physical attributes are cheap to observe. If a particular physical attribute is perceived as correlated with a more costly to observe one, the observer might use the attribute as an estimator or proxy for the costly to observe attribute. End quote. In a sense, Professor Wilson's reactions were similar to those of people who blame store owners for the high prices charged in low-income, high-crime neighborhoods, rather than blame those whose behavior raised the costs that the store pr- store's prices have to cover. There was a time when ordinary blacks, with far less education than Professor Wilson, saw clearly that the misbehavior of, black, of a black underclass would cause other blacks to be burdened with a backlash. Imposed Residential and Social Sorting In addition to spontaneous self-sorting, there is no question that there has also been residential discrimination too, in the plain sense that governmental regulations have explicitly prescribed where people of a particular race, religion, or other social identity can and cannot live. These would include the original ghettos to which Jews were consigned in particular European cities in centuries past, or whole geographic regions of the Russian Empire where Jews were permitted or not permitted to settle. The areas where Jews were permitted to live were called, quote, the Pale of Settlement, end quote, a phrase surviving in the English language today in statements about certain things being, quote, beyond the pale, end quote. Similar residential restrictions were placed on the overseas Chinese minorities in various Southeast Asian communities, as well as other groups in other societies around the world. Similar governmental restrictions on where black Americans could live have been common in various forms, supplemented by private racial restrictions. The question is not whether such residential restrictions can exist, or have existed, but whether the presence of such restrictions can be automatically inferred from statistics showing non-random clusterings of particular people living in particular places or concentrated in particular kinds or levels of particular occupations. Such issues involve not only casual questions, but also moral questions, the latter being the hardest to answer. Causation Even seeking a causal explanation is by no means simple. We may characterize the behavior of whites who do not want blacks living in their neighborhood as racist. But, if we wish to go beyond characteristics to cause and effect, we have entered the world of facts with its testing of beliefs against evidence. Once again, we confront the difference between discrimination 1 and discrimination 2. Going back to the earliest days of slavery in colonial America, there is no question that slaves simply lived wherever others told them to live. But even in those early times, there was also free persons of color. In fact, these free persons of color existed in the American colonies before slavery, which existed virtually everywhere else in the world, developed as a legal institution in 17th century America. 
Before that, the relatively few Africans in the colonies were treated like the far larger numbers of indentured servants from Europe, who were held in bondage for a given number of years, usually to pay off the cost of their passage across the ocean, and then released as free people. In early colonial America, more than half the white population in colonies south of New England arrived as indentured servants. The relative handful of blacks at that time were treated the same were treated the same legally in that regard, but not socially. As the numbers of Africans brought to the colonies increased greatly, their fate became that of perpetual slavery for them and their descendants. Thus began a cycle of retrogressions followed by progress, followed by new retrogressions, followed by new progress, in the treatment of, black pop- of the black population. The reasons for these oscillations tell us something about discrimination one and discrimination two. Even if racist ideas, assumptions, and aversions might fully explain discrimination against blacks, that would still leave unexplained these oscillations, which represented major changes back and forth, lasting for generations in both the 19th century and 20th century. Major restrictions, both legal and social, against quote, free, pre- free persons of color, end quote, existed in both the North and the South during the era of slavery. But while those restrictions tightened over time in the South during the 19th century, they eroded in the North during the same century. In the South, where plantation slavery was the norm, free persons of color were seen as dangers to that whole system, both because their very presence demonstrated to slaves that slavery was not an inevitable fate for black people, and because the fraternization of free persons of color with slaves not only spread the idea of freedom, but also provided a source of help for slaves who escaped. In the North, whose climate was not conducive to plantation slavery, and where blacks were a marginal part of the total population, Both legal and social restrictions against blacks were not as severe and, more important, began to erode significantly in the second half of the 19th century, after successive generations of northern blacks began to acculturate to the behavioral norms of the much larger white population around them. One indicator of this acculturation to the norms of the larger society was that the black-white difference in homicide rates in various northern communities during the first half of the 19th century was much smaller than it would become a century later. In a monumental treatise on violence in countries around the world, The Better Angels of Our Nature, author Steven Pinker noted, In the northeastern cities in New England and in the Midwest and in Virginia, blacks and whites killed at similar rates throughout the first half of the 19th century. Then a gap opened up, and it widened even further in the 20th century when homicides among African Americans skyrocketed, going from three times the white rate in New York in the 1850s to almost 13 times the white rate a century later. End quote. As the small populations of blacks in northern cities became more acculturated to the norms of the larger society during the 19th century, racial barriers began to erode. In Illinois, for example, legal restrictions on access to public accommodations for blacks were removed from the law. There were not enough black voters at that time to have brought this about by themselves, so this represented changes in white public opinion. In 19th century Detroit, blacks had been denied the right to vote in 1850, but they were voting in the 1880s, and in the 1890s blacks were being elected to statewide offices in Michigan by a predominantly white electorate. The 1880 census showed that, in Detroit, it was not uncommon for blacks and whites to live next door to each other. The black upper class had regular social social interactions with upper class whites, and their children attended high schools and colleges with the children of their white counterparts. Writing in 1899, W.E.B. Du Bois noted noted a growing liberal spirit, uh, sorry, Writing in 1899, W.B.E.B. Du Bois noted, quote, a growing liberal spirit toward the Negro in Philadelphia, end quote, in which the larger community had begun to, quote, brush away petty hindrances and to soften the harshness of race prejudice, end quote, leading, among other things, to blacks being able to live in white neighborhoods. 
Both contemporary and later writers commented on similar developments in northern communities. While black children in most northern communities had long been educated in racially segregated schools during the first half of the 19th century, if they were allowed to attend public schools at all, this changed during the second half of that century. Quote, By 1870, those northern states that had excluded blacks from public schools had reversed course. Moreover, during the quarter century following the end of the Civil War, most northern states enacted legislation that prohibited racial segregation in public education. Most northern courts, when called upon to enforce this newly enacted anti-segregation law, uh, anti-segregation legislation, did so, ordering the admission of black children into white schools. End quote. These were not just coincidental mood swings among whites across the North. The behavior of blacks themselves had changed. As Jacob Rice pointed, put it in 1890, There is no more clean and orderly community in New York than a new settlement of colored people that is growing up on the east side from Yorkville to Harlem. End quote. By the late 19th century, most blacks in New York State had been born in New York State and grew up with values and behavior patterns similar to those of the vastly larger white population around them. However, in this as in other things, a major retrogression set in later in northern cities with the arrival of large masses of black migrants from the South in the early 20th century, concentrated within a relatively few years and arriving in numbers sufficient to prevent their becoming as acculturated to the norms of the larger society, either as quickly or as much as the small 19th century black populations had in the North. The same retrogressions and racial relations seen in other places of life likewise occurred in Northern schools. Quote, With the migration of hundreds of thousands of Southern blacks into Northern communities during the first half of the 20th century, northern school segregation dramatically increased. Indeed, by 1940, northern school segregation was more extensive than it had been at any time since the Reconstruction. End quote. In most cases, this was the de facto racial segregation in the North, as distinguished from the explicit racial segregation by law in southern schools. But similar end results were achieved in the North by gerrymandering school districts and by other means. Among the reasons cited for this resurgence of racial segregation in, in the Northern schools were both educational and behavioral problems of black children. However, as regards educational problems, surveys in both Chicago and Detroit indicated that these were primarily problems with black children whose families had migrated from the South, where educational standards were lower. Neither, areas, neither eras of progress in race relations nor eras of retrogression were simply inexplicable mood swings among whites. Both represented responses to demonstrable changes in local black populations. These responses were complicated by the inherent problems of white third parties trying to sort out differences among black children, even though sorting out black children in general from white children in general required nothing more than eyesight. Moreover, in the early 20th century, the rise to dominance of genetic determinism as a supposedly scientific doctrine strengthened the hand of those white officials who were prepared to write off the potential of black and other minority children as the progressives of that era did. All right, that concludes the first half of that read. Uh, our next read in this chapter will be in the subsection unsorting people. So until then, this has been Mike signing off.